Glad that you're with us, and I also want to welcome those who are watching online. It's uh, great to be back with you, and we're continuing our teaching series, actually concluding it on the Holy Spirit for the past three and a half months. That's a long time, by the way. Uh, that, that's, that's almost a third of a year. For the last three and a half months, we've been journeying through a teaching on the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that it's vital to our Christian walk that we are led by God's Holy Spirit. Now typically, depending on which spiritual environment you've been raised in, we tend to think, you know, it's, I'm led by my emotions, you know, I go as my heart goes. But that's not always the best philosophy of life. Some depend on their intellect or lack thereof, but, you know, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go with what my mind tells me, and it's, I'm going to base it on my experiences and my knowledge situation, which is wonderful, but not necessarily optimal. And then some go with discernment, or what their gut says. I'm going to go with my gut. My gut tells me to do this, or my gut tells me to do that. And all of those things are wonderful, and they're not necessarily bad in and of itself, but God has a much better plan. In God's Word, He has willed for us to be led of his Holy Spirit. That is God's will for our lives, that we would be led by God's Spirit in just about everything we do, from decisions to relationships to finances to moral responsibilities. But thinking, digging down even deeper, God wants us to be led by the Spirit in our character, in who we are as a person, in who we are before him. God wants us to be led by his spirit and how we treat other people, not just to have a lip service faith. And so I realize that uh, there's uh, broad strokes of who comes to church on a given Sunday. You know, so I just want to just share with everybody, no matter where you are, you know, if you came here this morning and you're thinking you're worthless and you have no shot to apply anything that God says, I want to remind you that you find your substance in Christ and in the cross and hopefully over these next few minutes, you could be encouraged by such. Or if you rode in here on a high horse, thinking you know it all, and you know what, it's all about me, I hope that you're knocked off your high horse, and you realize that it's about God. And true change comes by being led of God's Holy Spirit. So we've journeyed through the fruits of the Spirit. We've talked about some of the beliefs of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, I want to talk with you about a very important area of life, and it is the area that help comes from the Holy Spirit. And we need that. We need the help of God in our life. Life is too unpredictable, too difficult at times, too overwhelming, filled with responsibilities. And you and I have, uh, have a laundry list of mess-ups and wrong steps and wrong paths that we follow. We need the help of the Holy Spirit in this life. And I'm so thankful that in God's holy word, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit this way. So if you don't mind, take out your teaching outline so you can follow right along as we look at from God's word, the help that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand that Jesus identified the Holy Spirit as the helper. That's who Jesus identified the Holy Spirit as, the helper. Right before he would go to the cross, the disciples who were caught up in this, you know, this windstorm of emotions because their leader, um, the one that they were following for three years, was about to step off the scene. He had been predicting his death. He said, the time has come. It was very dramatic, very troublesome to them. And Jesus said, don't worry, I'm going to go. And when I go, I'm going to send the helper. And what you and I need to realize is, before we can go any further, we need to come to an understanding that we need the help of God in this life. Our nation desperately needs that. As we contemplate perhaps engaging in another battle overseas, our country, our world desperately needs the help of God. It always has, it always will. And it's so important that we as God's people, as God's church, we don't just treat God as just some dignitary in the stands and we kind of nod our cap to him every once in a while. We acknowledge him, but rather we depend fully on him. In fact, a great posture of your life as a believer is that you would be fully dependent upon God's help in your life. God's help in your home, God's help in your marriage, God's help in every area of your life. 
So this morning, help from the Holy Spirit, I hope will tie together that which all we've studied over these last 16 weeks together. God wants us to depend fully on him, and it's when we do that that we are ultimately being spirit-led. So Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the helper. Now there's a word that we're going to see throughout this morning's message, the helper which Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit. And that word in Greek is parakletes, okay? Parakletes. And parakletes means this. This is the definition. One called alongside to help. In other words, Jesus in his wisdom knew that he was going to ascend to the right hand of God the Father in heaven, and it was his plan from the very beginning that he would send a helper alongside of his followers so that the Holy Spirit would be able to direct and help lead the believer's life. That it just wouldn't be, you know what, I hope it all works out for you. It's been a great three years. If you need me, say a few prayers. You know that Our Father thing, other than that every once in a while, and you'll be okay. Many folks settle for living the Christian life just like that. Throwing up a few prayers when we need them asking him to bless a few things that we do, coming to him every time we feel guilty so we can feel better about ourselves, and that's the extent of the Christian life. Some go the other extreme, try to overcompensate the Holy Spirit and try to manufacture the presence of the Spirit. Both are settling. You want to be balanced, and you want the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you want to do just as Jesus said, you want to identify the Holy Spirit as one who has been called alongside your life to help you. And so the Holy Spirit is very powerful. And Jesus has given us four promises concerning the help of the Holy Spirit. And it's important that you're mindful of them because as you're mindful of them, you can help live your life in confidence according to them. And that will become a great comfort in your life. And so... Take notice of these first groupings of verses. In this particular real estate of the Scripture, in John chapter 14 and 15, it was just hours before Christ would be betrayed and be crucified. And it's in these short hours that Jesus delivers some very powerful promises concerning the Holy Spirit. It's important that each and every one of us are mindful of them. Starting in John chapter 14, verses 15 and 17, this is what Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Spirit's help. Jesus said this, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Very important. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. And so you can underline that right there, another helper. Jesus is going to give another helper, he says, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now look at these first groupings of verses right here. First it starts off, if you love me you will keep my commands. This is very big on God's list. In other words, if you truly are following me and you love me, you're going to do what? You're going to obey what I have to say. That is very big in God's spiritual economy, obedience. Not delayed obedience, not when I feel like it, obedience, obedience. As you know, for those of you who are parents, partial obedience is what? Disobedience. Delayed obedience is what? Disobedience. God, because he loves us and he knows that obedience is tied to truly understanding the help of the Spirit, he starts off, he preferences it, Jesus, by saying this. Before I get to the helper, let me tell you this. Please, he's pleading with his disciples, if you love me, it's an emphatic. Now, you'll notice the word love there, and we usually throw the word love around like a football. Oh, I love the Giants, or I love the Jets, I love Begziti, I love a day at the beach, I love summer vacation. We just throw the word love around like it's a football. It just, just rolls right off our tongue. And usually, when we describe that, it's conditional. Because guess what happens if your team that you love starts doing bad? You start doing what? Some of you need to go for anger management. Start yelling at the screen. Imagine doing that in a marriage and something don't go right. You start yelling. Yelling at you. You start doing this. Well, you know what? You're going to need couples counseling soon. That's not the type of love that we need to have. That's a conditional love, isn't it? How about 
We go to a restaurant that we love, but the food doesn't come out the way we want it. Well, we're going to be a little upset. We might complain. We might not go back. Why? Because we're conditional people. And you know what has happened in modern church? More so, unfortunately, in America because we have all the goodies and treats. And we think it's like Burger King, our way, right away. That's how we think. Just how we are conditioned. A lot of theology leads people that way. You won't get that here, but... Keep this in mind, the word love here is unconditional. It's agape love. Jesus isn't saying, hey, if all, if, if all the circumstances work out in your life, then keep my commandments. Hey, if it's convenient for you, keep my commandments. I don't want to get in the way of any of your plans. I don't want to challenge you to live more of a, a life after me. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever works for you, just go with it. Jesus was not... Offering that counsel. He was giving a clear cut truth statement here. If you love me unconditionally. If you're willing to follow me without preconditions. Because I've loved you that way by the way. You know what it says in Romans? That while we were still dead in our sins. He what? He loved us. And so God has an unconditional love towards us. And he asks that we would have the same to him. If you unconditionally follow me and love me, in other words, you will keep my commands. Now the word keep is terio in the Greek language and it means to hold fast, to hold close to you. You know, again, God's commands aren't something that we should just treat loosely. When they apply, I'll put it in my life. No, we should hold them tight. They should be important to us, in other words, Jesus says. And he says, if you do that, I know you love me if you keep my commands. And if you do that, so, so that's what we got to do. And Jesus says this, I will then ask the Father. So if you keep my commands, you're going to be able to understand the presence and the power of what I'm about to tell you. In other words, if you, you stop making it about you across the board, and you make it about the Father... I will ask the Father, and he will give you another. And you want to circle that word another. It's important to understand the context of this. Another, allos in the Greek language, and it doesn't mean something different. Allos means something of the same kind. That's why we, are, we believe in the Holy Trinity here at Crossroads. It's implied throughout the Scripture, and it's here, right here in this Greek word, allos. I'm going to send you another kind of who? Of Ronald McDonald? Of who? Of him. I'm going to leave and I'm going to send another, that's what that Greek word means, of the same kind as me. I'm going to send you another person in the Godhead Trinity. I'm going to send you the Spirit. Another means that, another of the same kind. And this another is the helper, as we identified earlier, as the paracletes. One called alongside to help. And he's going to be with you Notice the scripture says, say it with me, forever. He's going to be with me forever. He's going to be with you forever. That's the promise. Jesus said that before he ascended to God the Father in heaven. Didn't he in the Great Commission? Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of this age. What a promise that is. So this is a, an incredible promise right here. And it goes on to say, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him for he dwells within you. That word dwells in the Greek language as we shared a few weeks ago means permanent residency. So that ties together what you just said forever. This spirit who I'm sending to help you, another of the same kind, will permanently be with you. He'll be with you forever because he dwells within you and he will be in you. What a promise this is. Why this is important and it's attached to commandments and the helper is that the only way for true life change is by the Holy Spirit. The only way to be convicted that we're not walking according to God's commandments is through the Holy Spirit. The only way to be convicted that we're a conditional Christian is by the Holy Spirit. The only way to keep God's commandments is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the only way from going somebody who walks a totally different way than God's ways to being somebody who worships God and follows God is by the Holy Spirit. And so here's a promise that Jesus is implying here in these verses, and you need to write this down. Promise number one, the Holy Spirit promises help 
with transformation. Transformation. Church is not about information. How much information could I get here? It's not about just information. It's about transformation. Church is not about entertainment. Oh, let, me, let me come here. What's the pastor going to say, wear, and talk, and smell, and all that? You know, how am I going to be entertained? No, this is not, ent- it's not an entertainment place. Want you to have fun. Want you to see your family. Want your faith to be in- enlarged. All of those things. The most important thing, though, is that we're challenged to be more like Christ. It's the most important thing. The most important thing is that if you walked in here today and, and you did not know which end was up and you thought it was religious games or you thought, you know, um, you have to be this or that, but today you're going to hear that salvation comes from Christ alone, that forgiveness is found in his person alone, and you're encouraged by that. And you're, that is what church is about. If you're a believer already and, and you're walking the walk and you're running the race, you need to be encouraged to keep your, your flame burning for Christ. If you've come in here with a lot of burdens and a lot of troubles and you're overwhelmed, you need to be reminded that you don't walk alone. That he's with you in your valley of the shadow of death. And that it's just a shadow. You're just passing through. But all of that is tied to this important word, transformation. Only God can transform your perspective. And only God can transform your heart. And that is what God desires for you and I. In fact, the moment you become a believer in Jesus Christ, that is the project that he begins in you and I. He begins to transform us. I mean, think about your life when you first started walking with God. There were probably some habits that you thought you would never be able to kick. But in Christ, you have found strength. The Holy Spirit has given you strength. Maybe right now you're battling a temptation. You keep giving in. The only way that true transformation will happen will be through Christ. Now, usually, again, we settle for guilt. We, you know, guilt, you know, I, I feel guilty and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go confess it. But guilt has a short shelf life, doesn't it? But grace brings lasting change. When we understand the grace of God, what happens is, is that transformation begins inwardly and then it goes outwardly. When we just settle for guilt to kind of knock us around a little bit and we feel guilty about what we're doing, oh, I got, let me confess my sins, I'm going to church tomorrow, I got to look spiritual, or this or that. When we just settle for guilt, oh, I got to get this feeling off of me. It's like when you're dirty and you take a shower, you know, and I got to get cleaned up. We think, you know what, let me throw a few prayers up there to heaven. I feel guilty and all will be okay, but we continue to walk in that way. That's short-term transformation. Lasting transformation happens by understanding God's grace. By loving him and following his commands and knowing that he's sending the helper and he has sent the helper to you and I and he's come alongside. The Holy Spirit promises help with transformation. Write this second principle down. One that all of us need to know. The Holy Spirit promises help with troubles. We have troubles. Anybody here have troubles? You want to raise your hand if you do? Hey, everybody has troubles. We have troubles that everybody, some people like to wear their troubles on their sleeve so everybody else could see it and, and they, you know, whatever. And, and some people, you can't help but see their troubles. And some of us have troubles of the soul and of the heart that nobody else sees. It's important to realize the power of God that God wants to help you with your troubles. You were never meant to go through this alone. He wants to speak to the trouble of your heart and the trouble of your life. The burden that you have. Now I realize that some of us are troublemakers and we're still trying to work that out in Christ and we create our own trouble. We literally create our own trouble because we're stupid and we haven't given it over to God yet and we keep up the madness. And he loves us unconditionally to understand that but sooner or later, you know, God's saying, come on, get it together here. But what about those troubles we don't sign up for? What about those troubles that knock us off our feet? What about those troubles that just hold us underwater? And maybe that's you today. You need to be reminded that this, one, this another of the same kind, the Holy Spirit, the helper, Jesus sent this helper to help you with your troubles. A few verses later in that same chapter, John chapter 14, Jesus says this, starting in verse 25. He says, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. I'm still with you. That's why I'm telling you this. Again, what's the context? He's about to go to the cross. It's about to become, uh, you know, 
very, very troubling times are about to hit these disciples. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, there's our word again, the helper, the paracletes, the one called alongside, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send notice in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. All that I've said to you. As well as all you've seen. They have heard and they have seen Jesus heal the blind. Now again, it's sometimes that's hard for us to grasp. Sometimes, you know, we're desensitized with healings because of the perversion we see on television. Everybody's getting healed of a backache and a toe ache and everything else, other aches. Jen and I were flipping through the channels one night and there was one of these crooked preachers on TV. And this woman supposedly had uh, blindness. And so he came over and the cameras were on him. He was sweating and he said, in the name of Jesus, I heal you of, and before he can finish it, the woman started pretending that, you know, she was seeing. And I, then I, I heal you and he almost, he forgot about what he was healing her for. And he almost said back and then he said eyes. And then she pretended that she was starting to see, but she couldn't, like she was squinting her eyes as she was coming out of her blindness. It took her a while. It was really dramatic. And all of a sudden she could see, but the light, and she was going into this whole thing. The cameras quickly panned off her because he looked like a phony as it was going on. Because when Jesus healed blindness in the Bible, they didn't need to put patches over their eyes to adjust to the lights. He healed the whole part of the eye. He healed them instantly. When he healed somebody who couldn't walk, he repaired all the tissue in the knee. They didn't have to go to six weeks of rehab. He does a complete healing. They witnessed complete healings, not partial healings. Not a script to go get physical therapy. Not special glasses when you go outside on a sunny day between 12 and 4. And so we have to understand that he will help you in your troubles because he's a God who still heals. He's a God who heals the broken heart. He binds them up, the scripture says. And they witness this. The Holy Spirit helps in times of trouble. He went on to say this, peace I leave with you. I'm leaving my peace with you. But my friends, as we know, in order to have the peace of God, first we need to have peace with God. We need to trust in Christ alone as our Lord and our Savior that he died on the cross, that he paid in our sins for full, in full. Now some of us go, I already know that, but you don't live like that. You don't live in complete dependence of Christ that way. You want to have that peace in your life that no matter what troubling times you are in, you are stable in Christ. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I'm giving you my peace, and that peace is coming through the one I've called alongside to be with you, who is what? A good rock charm, a rabbit's foot, a cross to keep around your neck, a saint that's made out of marble for you to go pray to and lay in touch, dirty, holy water that's really dirty water to throw on you. You need that, you know, they just throw some holy water on me. One time early on in the church, somebody said, could you come over to my house and bless it? How much is it if you bless it with the holy water? And at that point, I was about to get, name a big price there. <laughs> the holy water. Wow. There's only one that's holy, and that's Christ. Yes. My friends, we need to live that way. Live in that reality. Don't live a powerless life. Live a life filled with the power of, of Christ. Again, not to be a, a showman or a show-off, nothing like that, but to live as what was said in the worship earlier, to live the surrendered life unto God. So that no matter what comes your way, you're going to know that peace that he promised in the helper to be with you. Usually people come unglued. They, their wheels come off when things don't go their way. We become bitter and angry. And some of us go the other way. And we continue on into more debauchery, more, more unwholesomeness, more sin. God still loves you through it, but you're digging your ditch even deeper. And you justify it out the wazoo. Last week we talked about lying. We reason off everything we do. But help comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, this peace I give to you, not as the world gives. I don't give you short-term peace. Because you can find some 
some peace in this life. Hey, how many of us would love today if I was handing out free vacations to everybody in attendance because you chose to come to church on a holiday weekend? Oh, we'd love it. Hey, here's a trip to Hawaii, okay? And here's a trip to the Virgin Island. And here we go, let's go. And you can leave tomorrow and go away for a week. And that would, that would give you some peace. Some of you don't, you, oh, oh, what am I going to pack? And you get anxiety over that. But then after you pack your suitcase, and as soon as your head hit that water, you would feel like a million dollars and better. But then guess what happens in a few days? You got to come home. And so there are things you can find that bring peace to you in this life. I mean, money can bring some short-term peace. But you know what's funny? The book of Ecclesiastes tells us the more money you have, the more people that come to help you try to spend it, right? So money's not all there is. Health fleets and comes and goes. You want the peace that comes from heaven. That's the peace you want. And that peace comes. The Holy Spirit promises peace in times of trouble. My encouragement to you is to live in that truth. Is to trust God that way. And he says, I give this to you. None as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled. Nowhere does Jesus ever say, you have weak faith for being troubled. In fact, at the start of John chapter 14, he says, again, this, let not your heart be troubled. The Greek language conveys the idea in the tenses that trouble's always going to be a part of this world. We find out in the same gospel that Jesus himself was troubled when Lazarus died. Trouble is a part of life. You're not a weak Christian if you're battling stress, anxiety, and trouble, and everything under the sun. The only body feeds you that lie. Fact of the matter is, is we're going to go through some troubling times. We're going to be shaken. But that's why Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. At the top of this chapter, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. And he continues on this understanding. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Because you're not alone. The Spirit is with you. The Spirit is with you in times of trouble. You're not alone. So don't continue the madness and make more stupid decisions on top of stupid decisions. Don't be bitter and shake your fist at God and go, why me? Because that's an unanswerable question on this side of heaven. And don't think you're exempt from trouble. It's a part of life. The fact of the matter is, is you stay strong and resolute and don't quit and don't give up and know that God is with you. And trouble's going to come. Now, troubles usually come from different sources, okay? Problems bring trouble. You have problems in your life. Again, some of us cause our own problems, but problems come your way. Things you didn't sign up for. People. Oh, boy, there are a lot of people that bring trouble in our lives, right? Oh, boy. And I don't know about you. I wish I could send them to their own little island somewhere. And you could all be troublemakers together. And you can write every once in a while. I may not open the letter. Uh, some people are ready to write the check for the plane ticket, I, I see, for those people. But, you know, you know just keeping it real, you know, just, we wish, you know, okay, just send me a letter every now and then. But, you know, people bring us trouble. Pains. Pains that we have. Again, a lot of us, there's a lot of pretense that goes on. That's how we are. But there's a lot of pain that's deep inside. And then the past. The past of our sins. The past of things we haven't given over to God. Things that we feel so filthy and dirty over. You know, some of us think that we need to put on the holy suit in order to come to church. Can I remind you of some biblical facts? Jesus was born in a dark, dirty manger, a feeding trough. So we could understand that he's been born into the dirtiness of our own lives and our own heart. He was crucified to a rugged, splinter-filled cross. Because that's where he paid for it in full. The troubles you have, Christ went to the cross for. And he's provided help. Let me tell you about some of that help. I want to tell you this because I love you, because I'm your pastor, and I want you to walk with victory through your troubles. Can I tell you about some of these things? Here it is right here. I'm only going to tell the person that said yes. I'll tell you after the service. The rest of them are out, okay? All right, Carol, everybody else is out. No, I'm just kidding. Do you want to hear about the help of the Holy Spirit? Yes. That's better here. That's better here. Okay, you got to help me out here. Okay, I'm working up here. I'm trying to help you here. Here's some of the help that the Holy Spirit provides. Peace. Peace. Jesus just talked about that. 
comfort. The Holy Spirit comforts. He's the comforter. That's a synonym for helper, Paracletes. He's the comforter in times of, of terrible grief. When, when a loved one is removed from your life, the Holy Spirit brings comfort. Only he can do that. You know, I've been at funerals where after the funeral, I remember one time I was preaching at a funeral and people were heckling me from the back. I've had all types of experiences, friends. Okay? I've had all types of experiences. I've had people, you know, give me threatening signs when I'm preaching. I, either the sermon was bad or the truth, they didn't want to hear the truth. I think it was the latter. And I remember at this funeral, I was, people were giving me, you know, the death look, basically. And afterwards, they were all out in the parking lot. We're going to go to this bar. We're going to get sauced. And they wanted to drink their problems away. They were trying to find what? They were trying to find comfort. And there's only one who can comfort them. And it's not Jack Daniels. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Councils. We make terrible decisions. We need to be counseled by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to counsel us and direct us into all truth. The Holy Spirit exhorts. Tells us like it should be, how it should be. The Holy Spirit advocates, we see in Scripture, for who we are. It intercedes for you and I when we can't pray and we're too weak from our troubles. Paul told us that the Holy Spirit intercedes with groans before God. The Holy Spirit encourages when you're down and out. The Holy Spirit will encourage you to keep on keeping on. And I love this when The Holy Spirit empowers you. The Holy Spirit empowers you and I to walk with God. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Now a hush falls over the crowd silently in our hearts because we don't want nobody to know we hushed over this one. Oh, I like all those other ones. Could you take out the convict part? None of us want to be convicted that we're selfish. None of us want to be convicted that we make it about ourselves. None of us want to be convicted about a sin in our life. But what's the alternative? To keep going and playing the game or to walk in the truth of God? He convicts. How about hope? Guides praise. He illuminates the scripture, meaning he takes these words. These aren't just words. This is God's living word. He enables you and I to read his word and for us to read it and for us to get something out of it, not just for our mind because this is not a lousy horoscope, rather something for our soul and our heart. And we need that in abundance when we have trouble. We need the truth of God to illuminate. The Holy Spirit illuminates the truth of God because it's the spirit of truth. Confidence, and yes, discernment. You need that when you're in trouble. Write this third principle of promise down that Jesus says according to the helper. The Holy Spirit promises help with transformation. The Holy Spirit promises help with troubles, and we need that. And the Holy Spirit promises help with trust. Things that you're entrusted with. Your family, your money, your time, and most importantly, your purpose that God has put you on this earth for. The Holy Spirit wants to help you in why God has you here on this earth. You're not meant to figure it out on your own. This is what Jesus says as we continue on this march of understanding the promises of Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit. But when the helper comes, there's our word again, the helper, the paracletes, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. We see the continuity there. Notice the spirit of truth. He's a spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness. Because you have been with me from the beginning. In other words, Jesus is saying is, is that you are going to have a partnership with me. You're going to carry out the ministry and the mission that I've set forth. Yes, you. And Jesus says that for us today. My friends, God has called us to have an understanding that is very important. We've been entrusted to have a ministry to the church and a mission to the world. You don't want to miss any of that. As you connect to those things, it makes you more alive in Christ. And the Holy Spirit gives you help with that. But in order to live that out, first we got to allow Him to transform us. Give Him our troubles. So that he can use us the way. Now, my friends, there are things to do here in this church. 
There are things for us to do and for us to be involved with. And it's important that we understand that the Holy Spirit will give you help with that. And so as God's Spirit convicts you to get involved on any level, to serve, to give financially, to pray for the church, whatever it may be, you want to embrace that because that's the working of the Holy Spirit. You could come to church here every Sunday, 52 Sundays, and you will never hear from this, I don't know what this is, this stand we got from the mall. They gave this to us. I don't know what you call it. This, whatever you call it, you will never hear from here, whatever else we use one day, your arm will never be twisted to serve God and give to God because that's an act of worship. And I don't need to do that because the Holy Spirit is going to convict you to do that. The right posture and perspective to have of a believer is not what I could get out of a church, but what I could give to the church. That's the right mentality to have. That's a mature mentality to have. It had nothing to do with age or how many years you got under your belt coming to church. You could come to this perspective and it changes everything. And as far as a mission's concerned, you need to be praying and reaching those who don't have the faith in Christ because they need that. Because there's only one name by which men can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. And you and I are the ambassadors of Christ. So pray for those who don't know Christ. Invite those who need to come to church who don't know Christ. No matter what church they go to, as long as a Bible teaching church. My friends, you could spend the rest of your life serving that which God has entrusted you to do. And the Holy Spirit says that we are his witnesses. We're to give witness that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Our lifestyle needs to tell that. Before anybody says anything, you need to realize that you're, the, you're a walking witness of Christ. And so we might need to clean out the closet, as the saying goes. That's why for the last couple of weeks, John talked about quenching the Spirit. Then we did grieving the Spirit. Then we did lying to the Spirit. We might need to straighten things up. God could still use you because we know he can, use an, we, he can use a donkey. So that about covers everybody, right? A few donkeys here. Okay, I'm one too. Okay. He'll make the rocks cry out, we were told. So he can certainly use you in your stupidity. He uses me in my stupidity. But he wants you to operate in maximum capacity, living surrendered unto him. And understanding that he loves you so much that he's entrusted you to serve in his church. He's entrusted you to greet people at the door. He's entrusted you to help people find their seat. He's entrusted you to work in the children's ministry. He's entrusted you to help with different building projects in the church. He's entrusted each and every one of us to give faithfully to the church so that we could reach more people for Christ, so that we can help more people that come in. And that doesn't just happen by osmosis. That happens when the people of God are willing to say, God, you have trusted me with this, and I want to make good on that which you have trusted me with. And you've loved me so much that you've given this to me, and I want to walk in that truth. The Holy Spirit will help you with those things. And I want to encourage you because I love you as your pastor. To be sensitive to the Spirit's leading to do what God has willed you to do, to do, you, to do what God has willed you to give. Don't rest on feelings. Be led of His Spirit in these areas. You know, as I wrote this message earlier in the week, I'm very mindful that we're going into the fall. And next week, we're going to begin a brand new series called Church to the Max. And we're going to talk about how as we walk with Christ step in step, as we come out of this Spirit-led series, we want to maximize the potential that God has for us in our lifetime as believers. And that happens in the context of church. And we don't look to the left and the right of who's here, who's not here, who's doing this, who's doing that. No, we look and we say, God, I want to live for your glory. I want to do your part. I want to do my part. I want to be your partner. I want to serve you because you've trusted me to be your servant. And you can ask me to give an account of it all anyway. You're going to ask me to be accountable for that which you've trusted me with. And let's live for God's glory in this area. God has promised help in the area of that which he's trusted us with. And write this fourth and final promise down as we close. The Holy Spirit promises help with truth. The Holy Spirit promises help with truth. And we need this. 
because there's a lot of phony baloney flying around out there. And you know what's interesting about teachings that aren't true and teachings that may just be good for the mind and have a short shelf life is they don't hold you together. Now, I'm not one for hairspray and gel, but when I need a haircut, I reach for some gel. And I'm long overdue for a trim up here. I gave myself a little trim up this morning around the edges. And every once in a while, I have to turn to gel. And so I usually turn to some different hair product gels, but they never work for me. My hair always flops down. But then somebody put in my hands some of this here shiny wax. <laughs> now maybe in five years, my head will be green. I don't know. <laughs> but it works. It holds it together. Okay, I just put a little on my hands this morning and put it in. This wax holds it up. And I brought it this morning to illustrate to you is that that's what the truth of God does. It holds you together. It holds you together to stay the course. The Holy Spirit has promised help with you processing and living according to the truth because it's so important. It's vital. If you're going to be spirit-led, well, you've got to be led by God's truth. You've got to be led by God's truth that maybe you're not all that that you think you are and you need to get it right before him. No problem with that. Don't hang your head low and leave. Be grateful that God loves you and he wants to convict you. You know, may, maybe, maybe there's an issue right now in your life and you're making all these, you're doing all these things. But you know what? You need to take a few steps back so that you can let the truth do its work and you can hold it together. Now, I may have said this recently. Forgive me if I've forgotten, but it's worth saying again. When you're going to make a great jump, what do you got to do sometimes? You got to take a few steps back so that you can gear up and then you can make the leap. If you're going to make the leap in your life, you might need to take a few steps back and, and let the truth fix some things and put some things back where they need to be. Stop taking steps ahead of God because you're only going to try to make your jump and you're going to fall again. Rather, take a few steps back, allow the truth to do its work, to hold where it needs to hold. God will do his work. Nevertheless, Jesus says in John 16 now, I tell you the truth. So why don't you stop right there. Whenever Je oh, it's all truth, but when Jesus says that, he says, I really want you to pay attention here. I want to tell you something. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Because there's no need for the helper to come if Jesus is presently there. But if I go, Jesus promises, I will send them to you. And as I send them to you, I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now because your brain is already on overload with all that's about to unfold. The crucifixion. People wanting to kill you. All that would happen on Good Friday and that weekend and thereafter the persecution of the church. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Hey, now that's one of the great promises of Scripture, that the spirit will guide you, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to be led by God's Holy Spirit. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Shame on those who, who fancy themselves as prophets and they got a new word for the congregation, all this other jazz. He does not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Notice that's always a main priority of the Holy Spirit to bring glory to God. For he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. He's going to take my written word, my promises. He's going to declare them to you. And all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The truth. And we need his truth. We need his truth for our battles with temptation. And we know this very clearly what the scripture says, that this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple of the Holy Spirit. And my friends, since it's the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit resides, let the truth of God do its work and allow God to change you from the inside out. Let the truth of God do its work to convict, to change. Forget about how it used to be. Why don't you focus on what God wants to do in your life? Remember this great promise that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. He's not done working on you. 
But rather than you just get a little pat on the back, okay, uh, little Robbie, okay, little Ray, okay, little Johnny, it's all going to be okay. No, bring it to the cross. Give it to God. Get right with him. Give thanks to him. And let his truth help you in your time of temptation. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Not only are we the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we were bought with a price by Christ. And we are called to bring honor to God. That's what the truth of God says. You will not be disappointed, my friends, if you live that way. Let God's truth bless you that way. And then, of course, with trespasses. That which we've sinned against and we have fallen short. Allow God's word to, to make you feel clean. To, to bless you with restoration. When the truth says that when God forgives, he forgives. As I've said before, he throws our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And guess what? He posted a no fishing sign there. And it says in God's word that he, if he is, says he's going to be faithful for, to forgive us, he's going to do it. And we need to live in those truths. Because those truths, the promise that God transforms, the promise that God helps in times of trouble, the promise that God will give us help with that which we've been trusted to do. And the promise that God will give us help with his truth. As we understand those promises, we can live the spirit-led life. I lay before you this morning as we close. Do not settle for any other version of life. Live for the glory of God. Trust in the promises of God. Live your life in response to the love, the unconditional love that was shown on the cross of Jesus Christ. And spend the rest of your days living for the glory and honor of God. No matter how young or how old you are, no matter how long or how long you have not been in church, how about you lay all that aside and say, God, I want to rest my life on the bedrock of your promises. And here's something that you might be having in the back of your mind. Will God ever break a promise? Well, up until now, you know what his track record is? You want to hear his percentage? 100%. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that, what he, that which he has said in his word, this is what he said. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But my word stands forever. Forever. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You know, I'm sure hell is petrified over a number of things concerning God. But I'll tell you one thing that makes the devil himself shake in whatever pair of shoes he's wearing. And that is when a believer trusts in the promises of God. That is powerful. Don't be looking for some magic potion or somebody to throw you a touch or some seminar or some service to change it all or some experience. I, I, let, me just, let me just strip it all down for you. Trust in his promises. That's powerful. Because what he has said he is going to do, he's always done. And he will never let you down. Because the greatest promise of all is one that he fulfilled. That the tomb would be empty on the third day. And the Holy Spirit gives testimony to that, that the same power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that promises these great truths. Let us live the Spirit-led life. And don't look back. Press forward to what's ahead. And let's keep our eyes fixed on the author and the perfecter of our faith. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Our Father, our God, we give you thanks in this place today, O oh God. Father, we surrender all to you, O oh God. We surrender these burdens that we carry, these temptations, O oh God. We surrender, God, that deserting Judas spirit, God, when we want to betray you, God, we give that to you, O oh God. Lord, we, we give you that Jacob mentality sometimes, God, when we want it to all be about us and getting our blessing, O oh God. Lord, we want to be reminded that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Lord, we want to be reminded that the cross is the, the battle call of life. Lord, we want to be reminded that you have saved us. And you have been entrusted to us, the church, the mission. And God, by your grace, you've given us these truths, these promises. And we know that all of hell shakes 
when we believe in your promises. I pray for somebody who's here today, God, that they would believe in your promise that you are the way, the truth, and the life and that nobody comes through the Father. Lord, I know that the enemy has his hand on their heel, but God, I pray as they trust in that promise that there's no other way to heaven but by believing in your son, Jesus Christ. I know that that hold is broken. Lord, I pray for the person today who's caught up in their sins and their mistakes. God, I pray that they would trust in your promises, that you're a loving and unconditional God. I pray for those who contemplated taking their life today. God, remind them of your promises, that you love them, and that you know everything about them, oh God. I pray for those who are struggling. God, I pray for those, Lord, who are running the race, God. May they never get discouraged thinking it's all in vain. We commit our hearts before you this morning. We want to live in the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection. Let us be spirit-led by your promises, O oh God. We commit ourselves before you in the name of the Father, the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, all of God's people agreed and said,